I'd like to introduce um, Professor Mahmoud Sari Olgalam, who is a professor of international relations at the uh, University, sorry, State University of um, Iran in Tehran. He has been uh, writing articles, books, um, with extreme insight and tremendous influence over the past 28 years. Oh, we're, as I said earlier, extremely fortunate to have him here. He's just published a paper on this particular subject of foreign policy uh, prospects for change in Iran at Carnegie, on the Carnegie Endowment for Peace website. Um, he's also published in English. I start with English because we're here in the UK. Uh, Farsi and Arabic, uh, very detailed um, books on the uh, culture of Iranian politics and of various aspects of in international um, politics. He's a member of uh, the, World Forum, the World Economic Forum in Davos and has an ongoing relationship with Carnegie and was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute. Without any further ado, I'd like to give um, Professor Sari Gulyalam the floor. Thank you so much, Naomi. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, and much appreciation to Chatham House for having me here. Um, I have six points to make about the subject, and, um, and I hope uh, as I uh, try to develop them uh, in a sequence, uh, they will make sense to you. The first point is that revolutions are about rigidities. Um, and if we study the Iranian revolution in the four, uh, last four decades, I think um, in the internal structure of Iran, uh, there have been occasional uh, flexibilities, um, some compromises, uh, uh, concessions, balancing political acts within Iran over the last four decades with regard to culture, education, economy, and uh, uh, the social atmosphere in Iran. But Ironically, uh, when we study Iran's foreign policy behavior, I think the, the, uh, the foundation, the hallmarks, the lexicon of Iranian foreign policy have remained solid and very consistent over the last four decades. Anti-Americanism and anti-Israeli uh, trends have uh, served uh, Iranian foreign policy in a very consistent way. The typical anti-imperialism uh, of the left uh, in, the, uh, Ira in Iran of the 1960s and the 70s uh, was put together with uh, uh, political Islam, political Islam's definition of sovereignty, producing quite a bit of defiance for Iran uh, at the regional and the international level. And it produced uh, self-imposed isolation and uh, if we notice the timing of the Iranian revolution, Iran went inwards uh, when China, Brazil, Turkey, and many other countries uh, entered processes of globalization and interdependencies. Uh, so uh, in contrast to domestic, uh, relatively speaking, domestic compromises and uh, flexibilities, Iranian foreign policy has remained rigid and uh, very consistent uh, at the regional and the international level. That takes me to my second point. Um, uh, why has this consistency been practiced by Iran? At a high cost for its economy. And in a way we can say uh, Iranian economy has been a hostage to uh, Iranian foreign policy and uh, over the last four decades, every single president of Iran has tried to uh, uh, bring an alliance between Iranian foreign policy and Iranian national economy with basically no success. Uh, Iranian economy has pursued its own objectives uh, with uh, much uh, problems and difficulties, particularly with the Western world. And, uh, and Iranian foreign policy has uh, conducted on its own course uh, the anti-American and anti-Israeli uh, discourse have dominated Iranian foreign policy. 
Now, two separate illusions have overshadowed this Iranian foreign policy behavior. The first uh, uh, illusion is this, that the Muslim world will embrace Iranian foreign policy and revolutionary message. That has not been materialized. The second illusion uh, that began in the 1990s was that Iran would be able to separate American and European objectives so that Iran can build an alliance with the Europeans separate from uh, the United States. Both illusions have not uh, have uh, proved to be um, uh, uh, wrong in the way Iran has um, conducted its uh, foreign policy. Now, let me say a few things in my third point about uh, why there has been this consistency in Iranian foreign policy. Uh, for a period of time, I would argue in the 1980s and part of 1990s, I would say Iranian foreign policy uh, was based on ideology. Uh, an ideology uh, focused on political Islam. Uh, and the definition, the particular definition of political Islam on sovereignty, bordering on isolation from the rest of the world. But I would say after 1995, uh, with uh, the Clinton administration in the U.S., when some non-governmental um, uh, institutions, think tanks in the U.S., began to talk about the whole concept of regime change in Iran, uh, Iranian reaction uh, were twofold. One, to develop a nuclear program in order to uh, have leverage and contain American designs on Iran. And uh, another was to, uh, uh, to engage in a very proactive foreign policy at the regional level in the Middle East. So the anti-West doctrine, regional activism, and the nuclear option provided ample opportunities for Iran to maintain the, the uh, configuration of power inside Iran. So I would say after the 1990s, Iranian foreign policy has been at the service of maintaining the domestic political order in Iran instead of pursuing ideological uh, objectives. And uh, this, uh, this foreign policy behavior uh, has been substantiated by an ideological religious narrative, by a populist impulse, pivoting almost to political isolation, and what I would call the Sinatra doctrine in Iranian foreign policy, that Iran wants to do everything on its own without any alliances at the regional level and the global level. And uh, the question is, can a country develop economically without alliances, without coalitions, without integrating into the global uh, economy? So uh, my fourth point is this, how has this narrative been able to survive separating foreign policy from economic policy? And, uh, and the pursuit of regional activism uh, for the purpose of, purpose of maintaining domestic political order. I think oil income has produced excessive complacency in Iran over the years. It has been able to maintain the domestic order and it has been able to furnish its foreign policy behavior at the regional level. And then we need to look at the decision-making structure in Iran. Uh, foreign policy decision-making structure. I would use the concept of calcification to uh, characterize Iranian foreign policy decision-making. The fact that the group that makes the decision is fundamentally uh, an introverted group with little global exposure and uh, has a domestic agenda separate from Iran's national economy. And, uh, and uh, not much new thinking has been uh, utilized over the uh, last particularly two decades in, uh, in producing new narratives or new interpretations of the, the global economy or gl global political system. In the last four decades, so much has happened at the global level. 
the demise of the Soviet Union, the Arab Spring, but none have had much impact in the way Iran has defined its foreign policy. And the other, um, the other uh, characteristic of Iran's foreign policy decision making uh, is what social psychologists would call cognitive dissonance. The fact that uh, not much new data is inserted uh, in the way Iran defines actors and uh, players and uh, issues uh, both at the regional and global level. And uh, my last uh, uh, concept that I use in understanding Iranian foreign policy decision making is the concept of groupthink. The fact that uh, very few people uh, do enter uh, that very uh, small group of people who make Iran's foreign policy decisions. So, <clears throat> and in the, in the uh, 2017 presidential debates in Iran among the candidates, if you have noticed, there was no discussion of Iran's foreign policy. Economic, social, um, and cultural issues were discussed, but not much about foreign policy. So, what we have also in Iran, another characteristic of the decision-making structure, is what I would call the prevalence of gerontocracy. Uh, a group of people who may be dissociated from um, not only the rest of the society, but also very little exposure to the outside world. So Iranian foreign policy uh, has developed its own version of containment. Iran has been active at the regional level uh, because it wants to gain leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Israel. So at the service of maintaining the domestic order, Iranian foreign policy has been defined uh, for proactive um, regional environment, uh, uh, activities. My number five uh, point about uh, this issue is where American foreign policy enters this whole matrix. American strategy, I believe, has been centered uh, in targeting uh, Iran's economy to induce Iran for concessions, for political concessions. And one of the points that I have maintained over time is that the nuclear issue is not the number one issue between Iran and the United States. And that's why I think uh, the current government in Iran two years ago oversold this issue to the public, uh, arguing that if we resolve this nuclear issue with the United States, and other members of uh, the team, then uh, we can count on opening up Iran's economy to the world. Then we can uh, encourage foreign investment in Iran. Then we can have normal economic relations with the rest of the world. Uh, but the conceptual centrality of American aim has always been to, uh, to intensify internal contradictions in Iran in order to uh, uh, induce, again, concessions from that country. That takes me to my conclusion and the sixth point, that uh, I think Iran is facing a situation after yesterday's announcement by the Trump administration that there will be no tactical solutions possible on the part of Iran in resolving its economic and foreign policy problems uh, particularly with the United States. Iran has maintained a strategy in the last two decades, no normalization, no confrontation with the United States. That may not be viable anymore, particularly if President Trump is re-elected uh, in a few years from now. Um, I think the message of the American decision is this, Iran cannot free ride the international economy. Um, there will be political costs uh, for that. Iran cannot have its own way of conducting its regional uh, policies and uh, at the same time uh, pursue economic development, banking, uh, commercial relations um, with, with the rest of the world. Iran in a way is an unsatisfied power. Uh, it does have the potential and the capabilities of disturbing a regional order in the Middle East. But it cannot shape a regional order. 
Uh, and that's why I think um, if we uh, uh, study Iranian uh, uh, behavior, it has basically been a defensive country. And I would argue it has not been offensive. It is involved in the, in the region in order to maintain and, uh, and to uh, uh, sustain the homeland. I think Iran's charm offensive will no longer work. Uh, given the uh, decision yesterday by the United States to enter Iranian-American confrontation into a new uh, phase. I think the art of avoidance may not be, um, uh, be used anymore. Iran has avoided uh, the uh, international signals that, um, that I want to have uh, an economy and at the same time uh, I do not accept the current international political order. Uh, and I think the message, particularly uh, yesterday, is this, that this is a package that um, if you want to develop your economy, have normal banking, oil and gas, and commercial relations, uh, Iran's political behavior uh, needs to be um, altered. Um, if we look at the nuclear agreement, uh, the technical aspects of the agreement are very clear and transparent, but not the non-technical aspects of the agreement. And that's why the agreement can be exploited in any way by any participant in, uh, for their own, uh, uh, for their own uh, interests. Uh, my last point is this, that, um, uh, that in Iran we have a state and we have a government. The government is responsible for uh, conducting and managing the economy. The state, uh, constitutionally, is uh, in charge of uh, uh, formulating foreign policy direction. And I think uh, the decision yesterday may force Iran, constitutionally and conceptually, and ultimately politically, to think uh, in a different way, in a different legal way, um, of uh, state priorities that uh, focus on security and foreign policy and then government priorities that focus on Iran's uh, national economy. So I think we are entering a new phase in, uh, uh, in Iranian-American relations. Yesterday was a breakthrough that dissociates uh, the past from the future and I think Iran uh, is up for very tough decisions uh, in the coming months uh, and perhaps a year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud, um, for this insightful um, analysis of um, the situation in Iran. Um, Dr. Sanam, right, like you, I'll just say a couple of words, a few words about you before you start, um, is an associate fellow at the Middle East, um, Middle East and North Africa uh, program here at Chatham House and um, also heads the Iran Forum here in Chatham House. She's based in London, but she also teaches in um, the Vice John Hopkins University in Bologna. She has consulted extensively with um, uh, high-level risk analysis groups, as well as been consulted by governments. And her main area is indeed Iranian foreign policy, but she also teaches uh, Middle East um, security and Middle East politics. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, with uh, Dr. Sario Kalam, who I haven't seen in many years. Um, I will uh, pick up on a lot of um, his very astute statements and try to uh, make sense of uh, the practical implications of yesterday's decision and how it will play out um, in Iran uh, and how it will play out uh, with regards to Iran's foreign policy. I will also be brief because I have a cough and I apologize. After I speak, I will probably cough for a few minutes, so excuse me for that. <laughs> I'm controlling it for the time being. <clears throat> um, yesterday's decision, of course, was very decisive and uh, in a way, the uh, certainty and the clarity is very important because um, uh, the ball is really um, in uh, <coughs> Europe and in Tehran's court on how to respond. And um, 
although we don't know how uh, things are going to play out in the coming months, if not years ahead, um, this is still a bit of a limbo phase going forward. And uh, while we're in limbo, it's important to consider uh, some of the implications. Um, President Trump, I believe, made his decision um, gambling, uh, if you will, um, believing that Iran responds to pressure. And this is a big belief among neocons in Washington who think that uh, Iran in the past 40 years comes to the table with pressure. Um, another uh, current driving this decision today is also their belief that Iran is weak. Iran has suffered from recent protests in December and January. These were uh, protests all throughout the country. And Washington uh, was very animated uh, by these protests. And uh, there was a lot of hope uh, that political change would come to Iran. And uh, this hope continues, I think, to guide uh, some of uh, President Trump's decisions. Uh, President Trump is also very much emboldened by uh, his new team of Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State, John Bolton as National Security Advisor, and has uh, <laughs> support from uh, American traditional allies in uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia. So uh, this team is important, um, and this team is telling him the time is right, uh, Iran is ripe for change, Iran responds to pressure. They're also telling him that Iran is not as factional as uh, everybody presents it to be. And uh, in, in this context, I would sort of like to unpack and walk and <coughs> challenge some of these ideas and connect it to Iran's foreign policy and how it will respond. Pressure doesn't necessarily work for Iran. And I'd like to remind you that Iran withstood an eight-year war. Um, and I don't say this because it's something to be proud of, but if you talk to hardliners in Iran, uh, they will remind you of that. Um, as a sign of their resistance, as a sign of their ability to withstand international isolation. And that war has driven a lot of um, <coughs> Iran's sense of strategic loneliness uh, throughout the region um, and uh, in the wider international community. Uh, also, um, in Washington, they might point to uh, the resolution of the nuclear agreement as a sign that respond, re Iran responds to pressure. But um, I would challenge that also because if you remember, uh, the nuclear negotiations began in 2003 and we got the JCPOA in 2015. So that's a long time for a country to withstand pressure. And of course, international and really crippling sanctions began in 2011. Um, uh, and of course, that was part of the decision making uh, involved uh, to, to come to the negotiating table. Um, but it was not uh, solely that decision. So I, I don't believe that the re regime necessarily responds to pressure. I actually think that for hardliners within, uh, within the uh, Islamic Republic, pressure is perceived as a good thing because pressure feeds into their narrative of resistance and that the Islamic Republic has survived amidst um, isolation, amidst adversity. And it's because of their narrative of resistance that the Islamic Republic has persevered. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to get back to that in a second. Um, I want to talk about this perception specifically also that the Islamic Republic is weak. Um, this is a, a, a point that I hear a lot in Washington. And um, the Islamic Republic indeed has had uh, protests almost every day since the protests erupted. Um, and it's likely that those protests will continue. They're acts of serious civil disobedience, women protesting, um, <coughs> people are angry, frustrated. There are widespread uh, economic, political, environmental challenges um, within Iran today. There are human rights challenges. They're detaining dual nationals. The list is long. Um, but I think at the same time, it overestimates um, and I, and I don't want to be simplify, simplifying uh, the Iranian uh, population by any means, but it's overestimating estimating Iran's desire for regime change. 
Um, there's no organized opposition. The regime has been very effective at uh, controlling and limiting the development of groups inside the country. And I think that that's important to think about. The outside opposition is not a viable, credible, united um, opposition as well. And um, thinking about these dynamics are important um, in overstating Iran's weakness. And through the years, the Islamic Republic has survived worse threats. In 2009, that was a big destabilizing moment. In 1999, they also had widespread student protests. So I'm not minimizing, I don't want to minimize, but I'm just saying, consider that this state is stronger than we expect it to be, or that we want it to be. Um, and this plays out in the domestic context because factional politics are relevant and are very important to understand Iran. Iran is not a monolithic, the Islamic Republic's government is not monolithic. There are differences of opinions, and these debates are very visible if you follow them in the press. Debates over whether Iran should be in Syria, whether it's going to pay, pay off, um, <coughs> doesn't always translate into the foreign policy realm, but they're important uh, to follow. And the consequence of this uh, nuclear agreement, I think, as articulated um, by Dr. Sayal Ghalam, is that uh, in the domestic sphere, President Rouhani is going to be very delegitimized going forward. This was his legacy. Um, this is what he banked on. This was his vision. This was his way to protect the Islamic Republic against the narrative of resistance put forward by the Supreme Leader and other hardliners. Um, so with this deal being discredited and on life support eventually perhaps even dying, uh, this is uh, the told you so moment for hardliners in the Islamic Republic. And this will allow them the ability to uh, perhaps uh, gain a greater legitimacy with the electorate and translate um, deep frustration with the United States into newfound nationalism. And I think we have to consider the consequences of that as well. And that is particu particularly dangerous. Finally, how does this play out in the region? As I'm limited for time. Um, it plays out because the resistance narrative wins. The resistance narrative has been the predominant narrative. And the Islamic Republic's resistance um, alliance is with Hezbollah, today also with Bashar al-Assad. Um, and they have successfully built networks in Iraq. They have now also extended um, in, and developed a relationship with the Houthis, um, also in Lebanon. And, and this, um, this vindicates that vision for the Islamic Republic. So um, I apologize if I'm being a bit too pessimistic um, in looking at how this all plays out. Um, but I deeply believe this is a bit of a miscalculation. And I also believe that the main problem, the main obstacle here is about Iran's role in the region. Um, and in order to resolve this, ultimately, it resolve, requires talks that address the regional issue and redress the security issue. But in the current environment, it's going to be very difficult to convince Ayatollah Khamenei and Iranian hardliners to come back to the table when they perceive that the United States has yet again moved the goalposts and uh, uh, is not to be trusted. Thank you very much, uh, Sanam, for um, this, uh, again, extremely insightful, thought-provoking um, and important yeah. contribution. Um, I'd just like to kick off the discussion um, also on a not very pessimistic note, but um, it's been made very clear that um, the uh, no confrontation, uh, no normalization may not be able, um, the Iran may not be able to sustain it. And um, hardliners have been strengthened by this um, United, Nation, uh, United States violation of the agreement. I mean, it's been enshrined in the Security Council, the binding Security Council resolution. It's, it's not just an agreement between Iran and the US. There are the many major powers, and um, it's a binding uh, by international law. So the question now is, um, how is this going to affect the whole region? How do you see things happening? This is addressed to both of you. You can start, Sanam can start, since uh, Mahmoud kicked off the discussion. How do you see things um, evolving in the region? In the, short, mid, and, you know, if you are willing to be gutsy and forecast, you know, and analyze the, the various uh, trends and dynamics, because we're sitting, you know, in a very um, complicated reality, you deal, you deal with it daily. Well, I'll, I'll take short to mid. I'm not sure I'll take the long term, because anything could happen, and black swans are black swans. Um, I think that Iran 
is going to be very calculated going forward, um, really because in the short run, a um, couple of weeks or a couple of months, Iran is going to try to be the good actor um, and try to retain, um, convince, cajole, pressure Europe to save the deal in some way. And by being the good actor, it has to behave in the region. But at the same time, Iran has these deep ties, these relationships that it has been cultivating. It has played the long game um, and it has been very strategic. Um, and the potential to be destabilizing is very high. Iraq is having elections this Saturday. And many Iranian allies um, could, could win. Um, and that could uh, be a very positive outcome for Iran. Um, because one of Iran's objectives in Iraq is to see uh, U.S. with military withdrawal. Um, and, and so that's something we should uh, keep on our mind. I don't see immediate destabilization, even, um, even in the Levant, even in the conflict between Israel and Syria. I do think the Trump administration has sort of passed the baton in, in, in that realm to Iran, uh, to Israel, to deal with Iran. And we, we will continue to see this um, Israeli response, um, rightful response to push Iran off um, and out of its borders. Uh, but for the time being, um, they're going to be very careful. So um, would you like to respond to this? Yeah, just yes. a few um, notes. Thank um, you for that. I think the region is going to be polarized further, and um, uh, Iran's uh, regional activities will be further intensified in um, many countries. Um, and uh, the divide between Iran and the Arab world will be much wider. Uh, if we look at the uh, history of Iranian-Arab relations, I cannot think of any other time uh, where um, there's been basically absence of uh, both diplomatic and, uh, and uh, commercial uh, social relations between the two sides. There's virtually no contact between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And uh, by that token, most of the Arab countries uh, keep their contacts with Iran uh, at the lowest level possible. Uh, and, um, um, of course, Turkey is a, a different phenomenon. I think uh, Iranian-Israeli um, uh, confrontation will be played out in Syria increasingly. Uh, it was very clear when the United States announced that they will leave Syria. And uh, I think that provided um, open ground for the Israelis uh, to make their own security decisions uh, in, in Syria. That will open up a playground between Iran and Israel over Syria. Um, the Russian uh, element uh, is uh, ambiguous. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if Russians will get further involved in the region, depending on their negotiations over many other issues with the United States. So uh, I think we're going to see a polarized, more polarized uh, Middle East and um, uh, quite a bit of proxy activism in the region uh, by all sides, and uh, uh, which will have uh, quite a bit of implications for the regional economy, I think. Yeah. And regional stability. Thank you very much for that. I um, have many more questions, but I'd like to open um, Floor. I just one question which I would like you to think about it in your, and address in your concluding remarks because I'm worried that if you can if you address it right immediately um, you will uh, we will run out of time I am um, and that is given that we are predicting um, an escalation um, in tensions uh, through proxies in other words the question is what kind of mechanism to de-escalate can we think about um, there must be, you know, there are conflict, uh, you know, sort of dispute resolution uh, <coughs> clauses here, there, and everywhere. But the question is really, we're in, we've, as we said in the opening remarks, we're in a new era, really, the post-JCPOA, uh, or as it stood with the U.S. in it. Um, 
So if you could address um, the potential de-escalation mechanisms at the very end, that would be wonderful, but um, I don't want you to address it now, otherwise um, we will um, run out of time. I'm going to take um, uh, quest um, uh, questions in clusters of three at present, given, um, yeah, well, the, the given there's a lot of interest. Uh, please, state, please wait for the roving microphone, and please state your name and affiliation and if you're a Chatham House member, that's all very well, but we'd like to hear what else you do. Um, so none of this, uh, I'm just a Chatham House member. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Sahil Ghulam, Amy Kellogg from Fox News. What might cause Iran to come back to the table? Is there any chance that some other deal, further deal could be cut? Thank you, Amy. Thank you. I'm Alex Folks. I am a Chatham House member, but I also work as uh, an election observer. Um, one of the uh, objectives w you said was perhaps the long-term objectives was to split uh, the Europeans away from America in terms of foreign policy and their relations with, with Iran. Has that not now come up as the ideal opportunity? Is that not now happening? Um, and how do you foresee uh, either Iran or the Europeans taking advantage of the current situation to advance their own causes. Thank you. Over there at the back, please. And Simon Albert from the Department of International Trade. What do you think the Saudi Arabian and GCC response is going to be to the decision yesterday? Thank you very much. Um, who would like to um, go first? Sanam? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I'll start with the EU, uh, US. Um, it is indeed a objective of Iran's, and they tried to do it for many years, particularly from 2003 um, until 2011. Um, I think both sides are going to try to maintain that split for the time being. I think there are benefits, but it might not, I mean, it's very likely that it's not going to yield any uh, net gain for either side. From Iran's perspective, we already heard yesterday um, and today um, that they need very tangible economic benefits uh, from the EU, and it's going to be very hard for the EU to meet those commitments to Iran, but specifically, obviously, maintaining the Total deal, maintaining the Airbus deals, um, allowing oil sales to go on. Those are tangible benefits that are very important for Iran uh, to stay on board. Um, but I think from the European perspective, I'm a, I'm a bit dubious that they're going to be able to provide all of that, because obviously U.S. pressure um, is going to be very uh, painful for uh, international companies. Um, but Europe has uh, this special role to play uh, now. Um, in a way, Trump has passed the buck, at least seemingly, to Europe. And Europe is going to try to be the bridge uh, between Washington and Tehran. Unfortunately, they didn't get the deal um, agreed upon before May 12th, um, and that would have given them a, a bit more unity and coordination going forward. But Europe is going to try to shuttle back and forth and keep Iran on board for as long as possible and open the door to wider negotiations because that's ultimately what is at stake. Um, I, I'm not sure they're going to be able to succeed, but they do have some ideas. They're already meeting. The E4 is meeting uh, with Iran on Yemen, and the idea is to then build upon that. I mean, this is Macron's vision to build on that model to then address the Syria file, then bring in Israel, then bring in Saudi, then bring in the US. It's going to be long. Um, and you know, I think maybe from the European perspective, this is the soft, the soft exit option where maybe, if we can be hopeful in a few years, President Trump won't be there. And then uh, there will be a new <laughs> potential to bring everyone back in on a stronger deal. Um, on the region, just briefly, um, the Saudi response is obviously very uh, well, <laughs> they're supporting uh, President Trump. Um, and specifically, I'm not sure uh, if there is a full scale GCC response because the GCC is divided, but Saudi will be the swing producer or has committed to being, it seems, the swing producer as Iranian oil goes off the market in the next six months. Um, but I think that their implications. Um, 
there to consider as Iran um, looks at its diversified relations around the, the Gulf, the Arab Gulf. It has relations with Oman, um, Dubai, Qatar, and Kuwait that will also suffer as a result of this. Um, and how Iran struggles to retain those relationships amidst that pressure is really um, going to be a challenge. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Um, on, um, on what will make Iran to come back to the um, table, um, I believe um, in the coming days or in a couple of weeks, we will uh, probably hear about American sanctions on Iran's oil and gas industry. Um, South Korea has already cut down 45% of its oil imports from Iran under American pressure. India is under pressure from the United States um, to reduce its oil dependence on Iran. The Chinese have, al have also uh, made it difficult for Iran to do business uh, with Chinese companies and uh, banks. So the three <coughs> Asian allies of um, Iran in the post-nuclear agreement have reduced their uh, commercial banking and um, oil connections to Iran. There are a few European refineries that uh, import oil from Iran and they can also be easily persuaded to shift to other countries in the Middle East. So I think uh, uh, the real pressure on Iran has always been the oil and gas industry where Iran earns its uh, national income to maintain its domestic order and to promote its regional activism. So, um, um, so further sanctions on Iran's oil, gas, petrochemical industries uh, will, may, will I, and I think it, uh, to a large degree, uh, is going to be the uh, American uh, strategy in the, in the coming months to pressure Iran uh, into renegotiating the deal or changing its priorities. So I think it's centered on Iran's oil and gas industry. Um, about EU and um, uh, US, uh, it's one thing to talk about EU governments and how they define uh, Iran and how they look at the nuclear agreement. It's another thing to talk about European companies and European banks. I think there is uh, uh, quite a bit of enthusiasm in Europe by the governments to work with Iran, to uh, keep close to Iran, uh, to contain some of Iran's ambitions. But European banks and companies um, are very much constrained uh, by the Treasury in Washington. So I think. Uh, uh, they will maintain the current policy of keeping distance from Iran and looking elsewhere. So um, I'm not very optimistic that the European option for Iran uh, will work uh, in the coming months. And it's going to be very difficult for many European countries to distance themselves uh, uh, from the official American policy on the nuclear agreement. About the GCC and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, I've often asked myself, as a student of Iranian foreign policy, why do Iran and Turkey um, maintain and can maintain, maintain friendly relations? Um, I think there is a, perhaps a simple reason. Iranian power does not threaten Turkish uh, identity or Turkish national interests, and vice versa. The issue between Iran and the Arab world is that Iranian power will diminish uh, the power of Arab countries and vice versa. So there is a zero um, um, sum game between the two sides of the Persian Gulf. I would think that many of these countries are uh, extremely pleased uh, with the development and mainly because um, uh, Iran uh, cannot uh, develop into a, a prosperous country uh, and uh, maintain good relations with the rest of the world. So it's al there's always been fear by Arab countries, and this is not just post-revolutionary Iran. This goes back to the 1960s and the 70s. There's always been fears uh, 
uh, of uh, improving or expanding and uh, or even developing alliances between Iran and the United States. So I would guess that uh, the main objective on the other side of the Persian Gulf is to keep a, a weak, vulnerable, marginalized, isolated Iran, but keep it intact. Um, a huge country uh, with a talented population, uh, quite a bit of potential, uh, and uh, has all the resources to become a full regional power, uh, but uh, with the current policies, uh, Iran will be an isolated country. So I would think that they welcome this development to keep Iran uh, weak and isolated. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, I've got three people um, who I've noted down. Four? Oh, five. Gosh. Okay. Um, sorry. Was there a question here as well? No. Yeah, you know, there I've got that. Yeah, I've got you there. Um, we can extend maybe by five minutes, but if those who will need to leave at seven on the dot could just leave quietly, that would be um, fine. We'll take a break. Okay, yes. Uh, um, those, who <coughs> those who want to ask questions, if we don't have time in the session, do come up to the podium afterwards and ask them privately. We will be available here um, to answer everyone's questions. But um, the ones, I've, I've noted them in the order that um, different people in the audience have signaled to me. So we'll take them first. Uh, Nazanin Ansari, afterwards Dr. Patricia Lewis, and then this gentleman um, over here. And if the others could, there was a lady, yes, um, over there. And uh, okay. keep your questions very, very, very brief. Um, um, I will cut you short if they're not very brief and keep the answers very brief as well. And after the questions end, please wrap up, make your sort of uh, one line. Um, uh, <coughs> we were discussing this one line message to the uh, audience and one, my, uh, one line conclusion for each speaker at the very end. Nazanin. Uh, thank you. Nazanin Ansari, Kehan, London. In the past month, uh, at least four uh, British Iranians have been arrested in Iran, uh, uh, including uh, uh, a head of a bank, Parsian, Mr. Mazri. This is in addition to Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe and the other British Iranians that were arrested prior to these four. Uh, why have they been zooming on British Iranians? Uh, and how is this going to affect Britain's uh, uh, ability to play a part in uh, this deal, this new deal? And uh, what, is, uh, what, what, what does it take to have them released? Thank you, Nazanin. Uh, Dr. Patricia Lewis. Um, uh, thanks. I'm the research director here for international security and increasingly don't have time to do anything else. Um, so I, I just uh, wanted to say I think that there have been many uh, instances throughout the last few decades in which uh, European countries and the United States have diverged on big issues like sanctions on certain countries. One can think of Cuba, one can think of apartheid South Africa, etc. So is it possible perhaps to um, go forward in... in cementing a, a, a different approach from Europe and then so then the final question which I think is connected to the last one is how will Brexit affect that? Thank you for that reminder Patricia. <laughs> thought we had a break from it. The gentleman over here please. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is William Crawley. I'm a fellow at the uh, School of Advanced Study at London University as well as a member of Chatham House. Uh, given Professor Galam, that you uh, say that foreign policy has traditionally been a servant of domestic policy, and given that uh, you say that hardliners are likely to benefit from President Trump's decision of yesterday, what would you expect the uh, leaders, present leaders of Iran to do to help uh, them exploit what they perceive as differences in Western policy? Thank you very much. I'll take um, the question from this lady here in the center, please. Hi, I'm Cheryl Tam. I'm an undergraduate student at the LSE. Um, when the Deputy Ambassador of Israel, Ms. Sharon Bali, came to speak to us last week, she spoke of Israel's vulnerability and its need to check on players such as Iran for the sake of regional security. What do you make of the suggestion that 
a more hawkish stance, perhaps by Israel, to bomb, um, that it's more effective to bomb brick and mortar facilities compared to airstrikes. What do you make of that um, in the aftermath of Trump's announcement yesterday? Thank you for that question. Sorry, last question over there. Can you kindly stand up? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name's Emma. I'm a researcher at King's College London and I work with the European Iran Middle East Research Group. I have a small comment and a question. Um, my comment was in relation to your discussion on the narrative. And I felt something which was absent was that in relation to Iran also securitizes the narrative. It's, al it's always talking about plots against the Islamic Republic, Iran's enemies and spies of dens. So I just felt this was absent. And then the second, the, my question is in relation to the article you published this morning in The Guardian. Um, I read this and I was wondering how you arrived at the conclusion whether or not Iran, whether in the parliamentary elections, how the hardliners would win these elections. Because I'm more observing the presidential elections, but what I've observed is that it's always the reformists who are the winners, at least when it's left to the general public to decide. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, we need, um, you have 10 minutes um, to, <laughs> to conclude. Yes, I think it's your turn. No, Mahmoud, Mahmoud, your turn. You please. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, some of the questions uh, uh, do not concern me. I d really don't know much about them. Sorry, let me so, just clarify. Yeah. You, you shouldn't both answer all the questions. Right, you answer yeah. the questions that you feel um, you can answer, <coughs> and likewise, uh, Sanam. Yeah. Why don't you start only with the questions you feel um, that you can answer, right. or uh, would like I, to answer? Uh, I, think, um, I think Iran is very limited in terms of... Um, uh, trying to exploit the differences between Europe and the United States. Um, they will, um, they're going to have discussions with uh, EU3 plus Russia and China, but uh, my expectation is that the United States uh, will try to um, uh, shape the agenda for uh, those kinds of negotiations. And I'm not sure that Iran will uh, make any concessions, particularly on security and uh, regional issues. And from what we have heard yesterday by Iran's leadership, that if those negotiations do not serve Iran's national interests, then uh, they will exit uh, the nuclear agreement. Then that will uh, bring Iran into a, uh, not only a political confrontation uh, with the United States, but also I think there might be elements of some um, military confrontation, at least in the uh, Syrian uh, landscape uh, or other areas uh, in the region uh, like, um, like, um, uh, like Yemen and other places. Um, the other issue that I'd like to uh, mention is that, uh, that uh, I think uh, Iran's future uh, will be shaped by how the country uh, will resolve some of its soft issues. Uh, environment, education, its economy, um, and uh, the fact that, um, uh, that there is a national problem in water uh, resources. These are soft issues, no matter which kind of government with uh, what uh, kind of mentality and orientation come to power, they need to resolve these issues. And, uh, and Iran, in order to solve these soft issues, they need to cooperate with the rest of the world for, um, for technology transfer, for uh, capital investment, uh, particularly in its uh, oil and gas industry. One uh, estimate is that for Iran to return uh, to its oil um, uh, exports level uh, of uh, 2009 and 2010, Iran needs some hundred billion dollars of foreign investment uh, in order to uh, return to those uh, uh, to those days. So, so I think uh, if we look at Iran from an economic perspective, Iran needs to cooperate with the rest of the world, and to what degree the country will be uh, prepared. 
to reorient its uh, uh, foreign policy at the regional level so it can accommodate uh, both uh, the United States and Europe uh, is, uh, is really open, uh, uh, is an open question. But I'd like to share with you what I wrote 17 years ago uh, in an article uh, in the U.S. Um, I think the main issue between Iran and the United States uh, is not the nuclear issue. The nuclear issue uh, is a symptom of a larger problem. Um, the main problem between Iran and the United States that has overshadowed economic, commercial, security problems is Iran's definition and attitude uh, towards Israel. Uh, and uh, I think I have also written that um, that's if I were to uh, quantify uh, the extent of this issue in Iranian foreign policy and the problems that it faces with the outside world, I would say uh, the issue of Israel in Iran's foreign policy is about 80% of the country's problems. Um, so as long as uh, Iran does not address this issue, uh, it will not uh, be able to uh, uh, gain support within the United States uh, for an improvement uh, or a change of perceptions in the United States towards Iran. Uh, one reason why the Trump administration or any administration in the U.S. can uh, promote its own policies is because Iran does not have any friends in the U.S., whether among Democrats or Republicans, uh, particularly uh, in U.S. Congress. So uh, in order to uh, change that attitude and perception, I think uh, the, uh, the only option for Iran, if it wants to pursue that, uh, that uh, strategy, is to, uh, uh, is to have a different definition of uh, uh, the issue of Israel in the Middle East. Uh, no American administration will be able to improve, let alone normalize, its relations with Iran without addressing the issue of Israel. It will be item number one on the agenda uh, for, for domestic American uh, politics. Uh, so, so I think if we uh, want to um, uh, look at uh, Iran, the US, the region uh, in, a, in the next uh, five years, uh, that's the challenge that Iran has. And, uh, and uh, U.S. policy towards Iran will determine, shape the policies of many other countries, not only in Europe, in Japan, but also uh, in the Middle East and other places. So that's, the, I think, the main issue. Uh, we cannot say that Iran has, say, 25, 30 problems with the rest of the world. I think we need to prioritize and look at the main problem that Iran is facing. So the nuclear issue is a reflection of that other issue, larger issue, that Iran needs to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, I will only endeavor quickly to answer a few of these issues. Nazanin John on British-Iranian dual nationals, I don't know any more than most people. Um, you know, there are many theories out there, uh, including perhaps getting some money repatriated, and this is a... Uh, an effective strategy at doing that, but of course I think there is indeed uh, a fear of dual national interference, foreign in influence, um, no fuz, we hear about it in the press, and I think that um, this is probably the worst example of um, how things are playing out domestically in Iran, and it's very unfortunate, um, and sends horrible signals um, ultimately. Um, and I think it's, it can tie to Patricia's question on Brexit, um, the fact that uh, we are still here and Nazanin uh, Zaghari Radcliffe is still there is a reflection of um, the Brexit effect. Uh, and uh, the British government ultimately is um, distracted um, and focused more on its relationships uh, with uh, the Gulf countries, the Arab Gulf countries. They are a priority economically. Um, uh, there's money to be made in the Gulf, there's investment to be made, and um, you know, that's the area of focus. But Iran will come back into the orbit in terms of strategic issues, um, and it will be important um, 
to focus on Iran and to uh, maintain the relationship. So I wouldn't completely write uh, the UK off uh, just yet. Um, finally, um, regarding uh, m my thoughts on future elections, perhaps I'm being overtly pessimistic, but in looking at the different trends in Iranian politics, they vacillate like in most countries. This, this is the managed system. Um, it is not a purely free-for-all every time there is an election. Um, and I think this system will be managed. It is already, Parliament is already very conservative. Chances are it will continue to uh, be conservative going forward. Um, institutional unity um, uh, could be good for the regime going forward, but also at the same time it's important to note that reformists and Rouhani were very much implicated and attacked in the protests. They are managing the administrative arm of uh, the Islamic Republic today. Um, in Parliament to a certain degree, at the presidential level, municipal and local councils throughout the country, so they're just as um, uh, it, they're also in trouble with the Iranian electorate. So we could be at another 2005 moment, and should there be uh, someone to emerge, we should be prepared to see that both at the parliamentary level and the presidential level. Thank you very much, um, Sanam. I'd like to wrap up. Thank the uh, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd like you to join me in thanking the participants. <laughs> the